Hello and welcome to Andy's Little Sci-Fi Horror Show. My name's Andy. And I'm Drew. And this is our 10 minute window to the rest of the world. And today is a very special day because this is March 8th, 2011. No. 12. March 8th, 2000. March 8th, 2012. And it's a special day because not only is it a full moon, but two days ago, NASA got first shot of a humongous solar flare coming off of the sun. It shot 150 miles into the atmosphere and it started to affect people's moods on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And today we had some interference with airplanes and Pacific flights were altered and postponed. And this was supposed to be, in theory, one of the signs of the 2012 apocalypse. So today we're honoring the end of the world in movie form. Do we have to build a bunker now? Oh, I got one. Okay, I'll come over. Maybe. Let's get rolling. <laughs> Let's roll! Roll with it. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Okay. Get rolling, 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 rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Well, actually, I didn't stop rolling. Oh, you didn't stop no. rolling. Okay. The end of the world movies are a very interesting thing. The face of disaster movies was forever changed by Roland Emmerich in uh, Independence Day. Mm -hmm. The destruction of uh, Main Street, New York, New York, was a very popular thing. And the scene image of the Washington DC Capitals being destroyed became iconic to the point that they got mimicked and copied by many, many different. CGI is a humongous tool in modern day end of the world. Well, yeah. I am more partial to the 80s because there's something about the 80s. I mean, maybe we were the time frame or not, but um, there's something more tangible about an end of the world back in the 80s. I mean, you couldn't turn on the evening news without it like being, you know, Russia having their finger on a button. Oh. And the doomsday clock was always there going tick, tock, tick. It was just sub in our subconscious and sub pop culture. Well, I mean, if you look at like back in the 1980s, especially, there was no movie that really kind of signified the end of the world by nuclear destruction then yeah. the day after. <laughs> After was um, wow. They went. I remember then that came out. They actually sent notes. Our school sent notes home to parents, warning kids not to watch it. But I guess it ended up being this like, humongous, yeah, kind of goofy, ridiculous uh, thing. You know? It was a TV movie. It came out. I, I can't remember the exact year it came out. I remember when it did come out. It was such a big deal that people were just like, oh my god, that's exactly what's gonna happen. It had like Jason Robard versus in it. I um, actually, you know, I was into horror back then even oh, as a yeah. kid, but that actually had no interest in me at all. It, it sounded so ridiculous. Yeah. And then I, you know, of course, our older brothers and older siblings who got to see it informed us how ridiculous it actually was and the stupid like apocalyptic eating things. But getting back to the 80s, they had the best ones because they didn't bother showing the disaster take a right they kind of had the what was known as the post apocalyptic thing. oh yeah you know the the end of the world the end of the world had already happened you know mad max had already oh. become a cop in the post world you know it was just yeah it was you know, it was always futuristic but everything had looked like it was in the 80s mm -hmm. just like everything futuristic in the 70s with like a like yeah. Roger Corman film uh, it, I think that is better. I think it's yeah. better not having seen the disaster. Well, the problem, the thing about Mad Max was, once Mad Max became successful, everybody started copying Mad Max. It, because it was, it was easy. ideal. It was ideal, yeah. Yeah, it was easy. All you had to do was just shoot a film out in the dunes with a bunch of dune buggies, with a bunch of guys wearing hockey armor, and there you go, you have a post-apocalyptic war, war movie. Man, and yeah, and that format stayed true all through the 80s, and, like, mm -hmm. and died out before the 90s. Except there was a uh, director, Neil Marshall, one of my personal favorites from Dog Soldiers and uh, The Descent. Not The Descent, not the dumb one, but the one with the chicks in the, uh, in the cave. The good one. Um, he made a film called Doomsday, which kind of oh, honored that, that honored that. Kind of, but I don't think he's made a bad film yet. No, he hasn't. I mean, he, all his films are, they got something to them. Yeah, that was a really good movie. I liked Doomsday. I thought that it was well, well put together, the story flowed well, and, you know, it, it actually really kind of opened up the end for a sequel, and I kind of liked it. You know, yeah, well, that was, you know, that was a given. Wasn't it based on a book? I 
don't have the I knowledge don't know if on me. Based on a book or not, but yeah, I think it was. Man, that's how I want the end of the world to be. Cause I, I think I could be not necessarily like the tough guy, but the person you don't want to mess with. I don't know. I could see yeah. cars running on urine. I could see that. That would be great. I would have like the horn in the front of my car. And I don't mean the horns that beep. I'm talking about like the horns that like kill. The kind of horns you don't want to mess oh, with. You'd be Frankenstein. Come on. Uh, no, not Frank just like Frankenstein. I would. Oh man, I would get like a mobile home. <laughs> I can see that. I'd be all over this apocalypse. Yeah, you I'd, would. I'd be all over it. You would. And you'd have to get lots of hockey armor. Ooh, yeah, and like this, you know, like coat it with like nothing like, straight ahead. Yeah. As we were saying before, it is um, it is March 8th, and then there was a humongous solar flare in here. And it has done some disrupting. I was very excited to see that our atomic clock in our school kind of got screwy, which was awesome. I love it. I love when stuff like that happens. Atomic clock gets screwy. It was Actually, great. There's an interesting post apocalyptic film that had Patrick Swayze in it. And if you remember what I'm talking about, it was actually a pretty interesting film. I forget the title of all things. It's gonna, it's gonna haunt me now because it was interesting. It was really well done. You know what? Okay, look, I'll make it easy for you. Here's the trailer. Out of the ruins of a nuclear war, through a landscape of unearthly beauty and unknown terrors, and into a world struggling against the forces of nature and the forces of evil. Steel Dawn. Steel Dawn. So there you go. No complaining. I love that movie. Meanwhile, I'm back on camera. Um, one of the cool things about this is, in theory, even though it's a mass overcast of clouds here in Massachusetts, they say you might possibly get a glimpse of the Northern Lights. Now, I look up at the sky now, and I'm not seeing any possibility. But we're going somewhere where there's no lights, and there could, we could potentially see something if we can find out which direction is north. So you're about post-apocalyptic movies that are different than normal. Yes. There is one that is different that I'm sure everybody's heard. We've never talked about here in the show. It's called Waterworld. Waterworld. That was definitely interesting because that actually had uh, played off the polar ice caps melting, yeah. which was a big fear. Everybody's going to happen. Like you know, I mean, I don't know. I, don't I wouldn't mind growing fins and gills. <laughs> Bring on them polar caps melting. I'm ready for the beach party. So anyways, it's interesting about Waterworld because at the time, it was considered the most expensive film ever made. It was $200 million, and if you consider back in 1995, I mean, a lot of movies today are made for like $200 million, but back in the day of 1995, films were very rarely made beyond like 20 or $30 million. People also kind of looked at it as a disaster because, if I'm not mistaken, he sunk some of his own money into yeah. this, and you're not supposed to do that. There's a the, rule of thumb. You rule of, the, the rule of thumb is you never put your own money in a movie. Never put your own money in your own movie. It's like the, the rule of the producers if you watch the producers. Yeah, well, that's true. I think nowadays, Movies like The Day After Tomorrow, mm -hmm. and they take a whole different uh, approach, like Deep Impact. It had a good concept, good story, but you know, unfortunately, the star of those trailers is the destruction. And, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. it's kind of hard to make a, a, an original end of the world destruction movie because you kind of know where the plot's going, coming up on a destination. We're here at the location, and um, I don't see any northern lights, do you? No. Nope. Do you guys see anything? I don't see anything. Okay, it's kind of a rip-off. Go to the bunker! Go to the bunker! I'll, I'll put in a sound effect. I can't keep that up. <laughs> Good night.